Welcome to this latest edition in our video interview series here at iConnect. My name is Richard Albert, and along with Tom Ginsberg and David Landau, I am a co-editor of the blog. And today, our guest in this edition of Five Questions is Elaine Mock, Professor of Jurisprudence and Vice Dean for Education at the Faculty of Law at Utrecht University. Elaine, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Yeah, well, thank you for asking me. You know, I have to say before we start, Elaine, that you have been nominated by one of our readers, one of our viewers, um, for the series. I, I publish uh, a note at the end of each video interview, and it says, if you'd like to nominate someone, please just email the blog. And you were nominated, so thank you uh, once again for agreeing to do this, because we can tell our viewer, our reader, uh, that we are responsive in listening to him or her. So thank you very much. Well, thank you to that viewer. I'm really curious now, of course, who it is. <laughs> I won't reveal that, but I will say that you have some fans out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. uh, first question, Elaine, what are you researching and uh, what are you writing about right now? Um, well, I have a number of things going on, uh, but uh, one big project uh, is a research on judicial cooperation in the European Union. And I received a grant uh, from the Dutch National Research Council for that. Um, and it's a project uh, which connects with the goals set by the Lisbon Treaty uh, of the EU, uh, which concerns cooperation between judges in civil and criminal cases. Um, and so the, the research question connected uh, to uh, that cooperation um, is on the level of constitutional law, uh, whether it's really possible to design some kind of European judicial culture uh, in which there's a shared idea of what the judicial function entails uh, and more best practices between judges. Um, so together with two PhD candidates, uh, Niels Graaf and Aaron Jackson, uh, I'm investigating aspects of that uh, emerging judicial culture. Uh, and we are using uh, a law in context approach. And so we are combining uh, legal doctrinal research with social legal approaches. Uh, for example, Erin is looking into uh, what is happening in judicial networks in the EU. Uh, and then um, towards the end of the project, I will conduct a more normative uh, analysis uh, at the level of constitutional theory. Uh, so that's a big project. And then I have a number of other things going on. Um, actually, I'm writing right now for David Law to send me the uh, final edited version of my chapter uh, for his, uh, his book project on constitutionalism in context. Uh, that's a really great project uh, with lots of people contributing. Uh, and my chapter there will be on transnational judicial communication uh, in the European Union. Uh, and then one other thing I'd like to mention is a conference that I'm organizing uh, with the Dutch Association of Legal Philosophy, uh, because of course that ties in very much uh, with my chair at Utrecht University. Um, and that conference will be uh, about judicial independence as a constitutional principle. Uh, and the aim of the conference is to stimulate a debate between philosophers uh, on the one hand uh, and academics uh, in constitutional law and legal practitioners uh, on this uh, topic of judicial independence. Uh, which, uh, as, as you may know, is uh, very important in the EU right now uh, because of developments in uh, Hungary and in Poland. Uh, but uh, it also ties in more generally with questions on the financing of judiciaries uh, and questions of professional ethics for judges. That's a lot. You have a lot going on. <laughs> so yeah. how and when do you, do you write? You have so many projects that you're involved in conferencing and also writing and researching. When do you sit down and, and write? Do you have a routine? Um, well, <laughs> I guess I'm not the first person to tell you that deadlines really help. Uh, I would be nowhere without deadlines. Um, but then, yeah, I do try to, uh, to, to have some discipline. Um, I usually write on Wednesdays uh, because then uh, I work from home, so it's a bit more quiet than in the office. Uh, and sometimes I write on Sunday afternoons and I try to make it a bit comfortable with a nice cup of coffee and some jazz music or classical music playing in the background. Um, but yeah, I really need to, to create that atmosphere to uh, concentrate. And I'm always a bit jealous. I don't know whether you're one of those persons who can sit down 
uh, anywhere, like in a train or on a plane and, and uh, write down stuff immediately. I'm just not able to do that. <laughs> uh, we've interviewed some people who, who do do that and mm -hmm. who are successful doing that. But you're right, it is a gift to be able to write just anywhere. Yeah. Uh, Elaine, when did you know that this is what you wanted to do, that you wanted to be a professor, a professor of law? Um, well, uh, I guess for me that was when I decided to uh, do a PhD research. Um, in uh, many European countries, also in the Netherlands, that's really uh, the, the um, thing you need to do in able to have a career in academia. Uh, and for me, that well, came a little bit late, maybe, um, because uh, I already was a research assistant uh, during my law studies in Rotterdam. Um, and then I liked doing the research, I liked writing, uh, but I wasn't sure whether I wanted to continue in academia. Um, so the thing I did, first of all, was uh, to, to go abroad. Uh, I went to, to Paris for two years uh, and continued studying. Um, and there I really um, started to like constitutional law more uh, and especially the combination of legal theory uh, and comparative constitutional law. Uh, and so there gradually I realized that, uh, that academia was uh, a setting that really appealed to me. And so then I returned to the Netherlands and started doing the PhD research. And uh, well, I guess uh, the rest is history as they say. The rest, the rest is history still being written. Many chapters still to be written. Mm -hmm. uh, Elaine, go back to your years as a, a law student. Was there a book at the time or uh, an article, something uh, scholarly that really influenced you at that time that continues to resonate with you today, that continues to inform how you think about the law and your research and your writing? Mm. That's, uh, that's a really difficult question uh, because there are so many uh, books and articles that, uh, that influence me still. Um, in legal theory, there are of course some of the classics uh, by Hart and Dworkin, uh, which uh, I go back to again and again. And then in constitutional law, um, there's quite a number. Uh, so I'm thinking the work of Mitchell Lesser, uh, Judicial Deliberations, Judicial Transformations. Uh, also the work of Ron Herschel uh, towards juristocracy and comparative matters. Um, John Bell's uh, Judiciaries Within Europe. And then basically also uh, everything written by Kim Lane Schiappela on uh, transitional constitutionalism and on the rule of law in Eastern Europe. Uh, these are the kind of, uh, of things that uh, really uh, strike a chord uh, with me. Um, and I guess it's because they, they all have this combination uh, of legal doctrinal research, uh, but then also a more external perspective on the law. Uh, so either a social legal approach uh, or a more normative uh, philosophical reflection on the law. Uh, so, so that's a whole series and uh, I guess they, they still influence me in, in numerous ways. Um, and, and apart from that, uh, on, on a completely different note, also many novels and movies uh, which have something to do uh, with the law. Uh, if, if I can just mention one, there's this great Dutch novel, uh, character, uh, character in Dutch. Um, and uh, it's uh, uh, about uh, this guy who well, has lots of personal issues going on, difficult relationship with his father, uh, but then he really finds a purpose in his life uh, through law studies and he becomes this brilliant lawyer and so it talks about that. Um, and I like that especially also because uh, the story is, uh, is set in my hometown, uh, Rotterdam, uh, which you can see here in the background. Uh, oh, thanks for sharing that. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. So we've talked about your, your journey to becoming a professor. We've talked about the scholarly influences on your work. Now, what about your own work? Is there one paper or one article, one book um, that really stands out to you as being most important, something that you think um, is most reflective of your work? And when you identify that book or chapter or article, um, we'll also link to it on the website when we publish this video interview so that our readers and our viewers can go and download it for free and read about you and your work. Um, yeah, well, as you just said, uh, the, that um, research is a story with many chapters. Uh, so 
Uh, I guess I see my work uh, also as a narrative and then different publications, they each uh, represent a certain step and they mark a specific point in time. Uh, so, so it's difficult to mention just one. Uh, so if you allow me, I'll, I'll uh, mention three and I'll do it very, uh, very shortly. Um, first of all, well, my PhD research, uh, which was on the influence of new public management uh, theories uh, on judicial organization. Um, that was the, the first time that I really um, did an interdisciplinary uh, research um, uh, connecting organization theory to constitutional law. Uh, then, uh, well, unfortunately, that's only available in Dutch, uh, although I worked some of the ideas into later uh, English publications. Uh, but then a second publication, which, which I um, felt that I really made uh, progress with in my work, uh, is my book, Judicial Decision Making in a Globalized World, uh, that came out in 2013. Uh, and for that book, I conducted uh, interviews with judges in Supreme Courts. And that opened up a whole new world uh, of, uh, of information uh, and that was also extreme, extremely fun uh, to do. Um, but well, that's also, again, not so easy to, to access for readers. Uh, so as a last one, I'd uh, like to mention uh, my inaugural lecture uh, at Utrecht University, uh, which I held in 2017 as a new professor there. And it's called The T-Shaped Lawyer and Beyond. And I just posted it on ResearchGate, so readers who are interested, they can find it there. Um, so what I, talk about, what I talked about uh, in the lecture uh, is uh, this um, changing idea of legal professionalism uh, and the, the current image uh, where uh, legal professionals have to still have the, this um, in-depth knowledge uh, of the law. They have to be able to work with law as a lawyer. Uh, but then at the same time, uh, they are ex expected uh, to understand other disciplines and to have um, uh, skills connected with other disciplines, uh, maybe economics, maybe psychology. Uh, and so in the lecture, um, I also touch upon what that means for legal education. What do we teach our students uh, right now in the law schools? Uh, and for me, uh, that uh, the ideas presented in that lecture uh, also are a point of reference now in uh, my work as a vice dean for education. Uh, so I'd be really interested uh, to uh, also connect uh, with other scholars um, who follow this blog and who are also interested in legal education and who would want to share their, their thoughts with me. Well, thank you for identifying those three uh, scholarly works. And, and as I mentioned, we'll, we'll highlight um, your, your last one. Um, your inaugural uh, chair lecture uh, on the blog so that our readers uh, uh, can, can have a look. Elaine Mock, Professor of Jurisprudence at Utrecht University, thank you very much for uh, joining us today in this latest edition of Five Questions here at iConnect. Well, thanks to you. Bye. Bye-bye.